Hello, English exegesis of Revelation students. Most of us know each other, but if we have not had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Dr. Elder. That is what I prefer to be addressed as Dr. Elder or Professor Elder. My preferred pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm very excited for those of you I don't know to get to know you over the course of the semester, both in forums in the class and hopefully in some synchronous meetings as well, so we get to see each other face to face. For those of you whom I have met before in person at an intensive or uh, via Zoom or some other synchronous mode, it's good to see you again. I'm very excited to have each and every one of you in the class. If you have found your way to this video, you found your way to the right place to start the course. What we're going to do in this video is pretty briefly walk through some elements of the syllabus, some of the things that I want you to know in particular from the syllabus. I will ask you to read the syllabus a little bit more carefully in this first week of class, but I wanted to make sure that I highlighted a number of different things. So uh, a couple things, you have found your way also to YouTube. I wanted to make a comment of why these videos are going to be hosted on YouTube. So many of you who have taken classes with me uh, before are familiar with this mode, but there's three primary advantages to YouTube uh, and why I host videos here. The first is closed captioning. If you haven't figured out out how to use closed captioning on YouTube. The down to the right of your screen, you can find a little button that will bring up uh, automatic, automatically created captions for what I am saying. So this is great for accessibility if you have any issues with, uh, with uh, hearing loss. Um, and it also is just another way for you to engage what I am saying so that you get to <clears throat> hear and read what I'm saying. Sometimes the closed captioning that's automatically generated aren't necessarily the best, but they are they are a help so that's one reason the other is playback speed you may also already be aware of this but you can change uh, how fast these videos run you can slow them down or you can speed them up and I'm okay with you doing either if you find that I am moving too slowly and you want to get through what I'm saying a little bit more quickly uh, I am more than happy for you to speed it up or if you find the opposite that I move too fast and you need me to slow down a little bit you can slow down the playback speed as well and the last reason is is for purposes of bandwidth. Not everyone has the same bandwidth capabilities as far as internet goes, and YouTube allows a little bit of flexibility of the quality of the video. So if you have less bandwidth, you can lower that quality. It'll sort of speed up the, the time it takes to get the video and also the amount of bandwidth that it takes. So that being said, while you're here on YouTube, let's move over to talk about Revelation itself. So here we have Anthony Falbo's Revelation chapter four, which is the sort of artistic centerpiece for this course. You'll find it at the, this, this piece, this artistic piece at the beginning of the syllabus with a little bit of an explanation of it. Uh, and you'll also find it at the top of our course page. And what I want you to do is I, we're gonna think about this artistic piece on Revelation chapter four in just a moment moment by means of what I call a lecture, excuse me, a lecture pause. Again, if you have taken classes with me before, you are familiar with this. If you are not, you are not probably familiar with lecture pauses, or at least in the form that I do them. Uh, what a lecture pause is, it's a time when I ask you to literally pause the video. So go down and pause it and do whatever is instructed <clears throat> on the screen here. And I know that there is a temptation uh, and I'm sure that uh, you do it often and that's, uh, I'm not going to berate you for it. So not actually do the lecture pauses, uh, but the reason for them is to get you actively doing something in a video. I don't understand myself as the professor necessarily in these videos just giving you information. Uh, I am guiding you in certain ways of engaging content and lecture pauses is one way for us to do this. So to encourage you to maybe do lecture pauses more often than you did in previous courses with me, I'm going to ask you to complete this lecture pause right now. Uh, so either once you pause the video, create a new document uh, in, in Word or Pages or uh, whatever process, word processing software you use uh, that's called Lecture Pauses for Revelation and save it in wherever you're keeping all your digital files for this particular class. Uh, and that, that file will be a place that you can go whenever you do lecture pauses so that you have a sort of consistent place you're going and you can see over the course of time the different things that you've done in the course and how your learning and your thinking has progressed. 
If you prefer to not compose in the electronic medium, not compose by typing on the keyboard, and you prefer to handwrite, there is a great value to handwriting. It really slows down our thinking quite a bit, and there will be times in this class where I probably ask you to handwrite things during lecture pauses, uh, whether it be on a scrap piece of paper or something else. But if you, if you generally find that you prefer to handwrite notes, I'd encourage you to right now, as you pause this video, go and find a notebook that you can dedicate to lecture pauses. Maybe take a sharp and write really large on the top of it, lecture pauses. So go ahead and do this lecture pause before we move to the next lecture pause that I'm going to ask you to do in this particular welcome video. All right, now that you have your file made or your notebook handy, what we're going to do is look at Anthony Falbo's piece, Revelation chapter 4, and reflect on it with specific respect to Revelation chapter 4. So one of the reasons that this artistic piece is the centerpiece for this course uh, is because it, I think it really well represents what Revelation uh, or what how many of us sort of approach Revelation, that there is sort of an oddity to this piece. It's what's called a cubist piece. A uh, cubist piece, uh, cubist art is sort of uh, art wherein when you look at it from different perspectives, you feel like you can sort of turn, uh, you can turn the piece itself and look at it uh, in different ways. And when you do that, you come to new understandings of it. And that's one of the things that I hope that we will do with Revelation uh, this semester. Revelation, for many of us, we come to it sort of not understanding it. It's sort of the, the the weird text of the New Testament. Um, but as we become more familiar with it and as we approach it in different ways, as we turn it over and look at it from different perspectives, we're going to come away uh, seeing something beautiful in Revelation. I think that's what Anthony Falbo's piece here does really well, especially when you look at it in direct reference to Revelation chapter four. So what I want you to do in this particular lecture pause is look at these two. We could call these two different texts, the artistic piece on one side and the text of Revelation on the other and see where Anthony Falbo has sort of incorporated aspects of Revelation chapter four on which this piece is based into the artistic piece itself. So I want you to just in your, in your file or on your notebook, just jot down some notes of correspondences or even differences you see between the text of Revelation chapter 4 from the New Revised Standard Version and Anthony Falbo's piece on Revelation chapter 4. All right, now that you have done this, uh, what you have in essence done is started the process of exegesis. In the first week, we're going to talk about what exegesis is, but what it really boils down to it, one of the things that exegesis is, is it's a close reading of texts, um, or it's a close reading of, in this case, of a text and an artistic piece. There's a way in which you can exegete an image by by pulling out meaning from it. And that's what you've started to do here in this comparison. So what I want to move on to is our objective. So now what we've moved to is looking to elements of the syllabus itself. So if you've already read the syllabus, some of this stuff is going to be familiar to you. We have three uh, objectives that are shared between the two versions of the course, the English exegesis version and the Greek exegesis version. And these are the first three on the list. Uh, so for you English exegesis students, these first three, and then the last one, uh, we might say 4B, are are the objectives for you. So everything in this course, from readings to assignments uh, to discussion forums, are sort of aimed to accomplishing these particular objectives, and I put them in order of importance here. So the first one is to be able to exegete a select passage from the book of Revelation, paying attention to the world behind, the world of, and the world in front of the text. So by the end of this class, you should be able to do exegesis. Uh, that is a skill that you are going to develop in this class so that you can go on and use it in other settings. Our particular text that we're going to be exegeting from, uh, our New Testament text, is the book of Revelation, but the skills that you develop in this class are going to equally apply to other New Testament texts and also to a certain extent also to Old Testament texts. As part of the process of exegesis, we're moving to number two here, you're going to be able to identify and articulate uh, some things about your own social context. 
One of the things I want you to walk away from this class thinking is that uh, who you are as an individual is, is celebrated in your act of reading and interpreting the New Testament. It's not something that you should sort of shy away from. It's not something that you should try and uh, push off to the side as you read the text, but elements of your social location, the so-called world in front of the text, are things that you bring to the text and those things should be celebrated. Number three here, uh, as part of the interpretive process, as part of exegeting, you're going to learn how to, and you will, use multiple different biblical commentaries that adopt various perspectives. So the purpose here is to compare biblical commentaries and also learn how to use them productively. Biblical commentaries are a very specific genre of book, and there's a, a number of ways one might engage them, but I want to tell you from the outset that I encourage you to think of them as a as a reference tool not as a tool not as a book you read from front to back but as something you go to to find information as a reference tool and then number four for you english exegesis students so skipping down to the bottom uh what you're going to do uniquely in this class that the revel the uh Greek exegesis students will not be doing is engage a variety of contemporary perspectives on Revelation. So you're going to think about how Revelation has been read and how it still is read, whether it be as, uh, as a document that predicts the future or as a document that says only things that happened in the past or as a symbolic document that is relevant to all times, whatever, uh, being able to explain those different perspectives and how your own theology and your own understanding of Revelation uh, uh, relates to different perspectives that have been taken sort of throughout history and are now taken in contemporary scholarship. So moving from objectives to our books, uh, the grading system used in this class, and the assignments that you will be doing in this class. So let's start with some books here. These are going to be the required texts, four required texts that everyone in the class is going to be using, both Greek exegesis students and English exegesis students. So this is the place where we're sort of going to be on the same page, to, no matter what version of the class you are in. Everyone is going to be doing readings from, from these texts. And I will say that uh, the, the first text that will be engaging uh, extensively is going to be elements of biblical exegesis. Michael J. Gorman's uh, book that really sort of lays out what exegesis is and how to do it. So we're going to spend the first several weeks with this book before moving into our books on Revelation. So we're going to think about what exegesis is, how to do it, and then start to dig, dig deep into Revelation itself and doing exegesis of Revelation starting in about week five or so. So all of these uh, are required. I ask that you get them as soon as possible if you have not already, but particularly this one, which we will be reading from extensively beginning right away. So then we have some additional text here. And again, this is all from the syllabus. If this is a little bit small on your screen, I apologize. And I'm looking down because I'm looking at my iPad. I also apologize for that. This is something I'll do throughout the semester when I'm looking down. It's not because I'm avoiding you. It's because uh, my screen is down here. So we have uh, a couple of different kinds of optional texts or additional texts. Um, in this first category up here, we have two different books, and I'm going to ask you as an English exegesis student, this is going to be something that is unique to your version of the class, to acquire one or the other of these and read one or the other. They both do approximately the same thing. They're a really good sort of introduction to the book of Revelation and perspectives on Revelation, uh, but they do it a little bit differently, and I want us to have a different perspectives brought into this class. Uh, so you have a choice between one of these two. Of course, if you want to get both of them, you can, but I will be asking you to be doing readings from one or the other throughout the semester. And then there are uh, some optional books that you no, don't necessarily need to require acquire all of them, but they will be particularly helpful for specific assignments that are dedicated to you as an English exegesis student. So here I give you uh, options for the book report assignment. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes here. And then uh, 
a couple of different resources for the um, the perspectives assignment. And this one is actually going to uh, be happen earlier in the schedule than this one is. So you may want to start perusing these texts on Amazon or wherever you buy books and see if any of them particularly look like a text that you might be interested in engaging. And lastly, the optional text uh, with respect to optional text is commentaries. I'm asking every student to acquire one commentary that's different than the shared commentary. There's a list here for English exegesis students and a list here for Greek exegesis students. Uh, as an English exegesis student, you are welcome to acquire a, uh, a Greek exegesis commentary, but you should know that Greek exegesis commentaries, the commentaries in this list, are going to presume a knowledge of Greek and they're going to utilize Greek uh, in in the commentary itself. So you you can get one of these, but if you don't know Greek, uh, you might be better off with one of these ones up here. And what, what we're gonna do with your sort of unique commentary is you're gonna be your commentaries or your commentators representative for the class. So there will be times where I say, uh, and I might ask you in a forum to say, what is your commentators take on this particular exegetical problem or this particular issue or topic in Revelation? And again, the purpose here is to bring multiple different voices to the table. So you're going to be representing your commentator, whether or not you agree with them and you are free to agree or disagree with them, but you will be their representative and they, uh, that you are bringing sort of into the conversation. All right, next thing, uh, perhaps most important to you, most important to many students, how will you be graded for this class? Uh, if you've had a class with me before, you probably are familiar with my specs grading system. We use a non-standard grading system in this class. That is to say, I don't give uh, each uh, each assignment a sort of weighted percentage of how much it counts for the class and grade on a zero to 100 scale. Rather, your final grade in the class is determined by how many grade items you successfully complete. So everything in the class is graded pass fail and you are able to revise things in the class. So if you do not, if the, your assignment or your submission does not pass, uh, you can revise it based on my feedback to get it to a passing level. And so the what you do successfully, the number of things you complete successfully uh, determines your final grade for the class. And you can see in the syllabus, I've laid out this table of what you need to do to achieve different letter grades in the class. The one thing to note is that uh, the exegesis paper, the final exegesis paper, there's two categories. Um, it might be completed at an advanced level. So if you want to, uh, pass the class with an A, A minus, or a B plus, you have to write an advanced exegesis paper. And in the uh, instructions for the exegesis paper, I tell you what you need to do to pass an advanced rather than an acceptable level. And also note, to be able to pass the class, you have to write an acceptable exegesis paper. So this goes back to that first uh, objective for the class, wherein exegeting a passage from Revelation is the most important thing that you're going to do in this class. And sort of everything in this class is moving towards your ability to be able to do that. So. Uh, to be able to pass the class, uh, I guess this should actually be removed. Uh, to be able to pass the class at a D minus, you have to minimally have an acceptable uh, a min an acceptable exegesis paper and each of these other things. So I should also note with respect to specs grading is that you have to complete everything in a given uh, in a given row to get that grade. So to get a B minus, you have to do all of these things. If you were only to do uh, all of these and nine, then that would put you down uh, at a lower at a lower level. So everything in a given row needs to be completed to achieve that particular grade. So lastly, a few comments on the different grade items or assignments that you will complete in this class. So there's going to be 12 opportunities, 12 weeks in the class, uh, and that's excluding our two break weeks, uh, to either uh, participate in forums or in residential classes, whether you are a distance student or a residential student. So there's uh, 12 categories of forums and residential classes. And this is where sort of you're bringing to the table the way that you are engaging within the content for the week. So there'll be different kinds of forum questions. Some will ask you to do more behind the scenes work and some will ask you to do less behind the scenes work. And for residential students, I will also give you prompts of what you should uh, come to class being prepared to do.
Uh, Greek exegesis assignments are not relevant to you, but short assignments are relevant to you. So there's three different short assignments. And by short assignments, uh, they are shorter than the final exegetical paper. Um, and these are a book report, a topical assignment, and a perspectives assignment. I have given you in the syllabus uh, the guidelines for each one of these assignments so that you can sort of peruse there what you'll be doing. And then the final exegetical paper, uh, we're going to sort of be working towards writing this paper throughout the course of the semester, and it's the culminating project that you will submit for, for the class. And as part of the culmination for this uh, for that, there are going to be optional world assignments. Um, so we're going to talk about exegesis as engaging three different worlds, the world behind, the world of, and the world in front of the text. Um, and so in your final exegetical paper, you're going to engage each one of these three different worlds in service of your interpretation of Revelation. And at three times throughout the semester, we're going to have a different world assignment uh, due. That is to say there's a due date for these um, so that you might complete them and get feedback on how you are engaging these different exegetical worlds of the text. So what it does is it sort of scaffolds your writing of the final exegetical paper, your writing and your research. So if you submit these assignments, you don't have to, they don't count towards your final grade in the class, but I will assess them fairly thoroughly and give you feedback uh, so you know sort of what you're doing well and what you might continue to work on for the final exegetical paper. So it's an opportunity for you to get feedback and anything that you write or use or research in these optional world assignments can be directly used in the final exegetical paper. All right, that does it for English exegesis welcome. Um, so I will see you in the first week of class. I'll see you in forums and I will see some of you in person in class.